Hey guys, um, I'm not sure if you can hear me or not, Laura. Um, I have managed to find a way to get this to work on my phone. I'm not sure exactly what is going on, but I cannot get my computer to do anything. And the lighting on my phone is absolutely terrible. Um, okay, okay, so let me figure it out. Let's see here. Hi, Diane. Hi, Julie. We are having a heck of a time tonight because I tried something new and it's not working. So, um, oh good, Christy's excited. Well, I'm glad because I am about ready to pull my hair out. We're 15 minutes late and I do not like to be late and I'm not sure how to get Laura to join us, um, but hopefully she'll be able to figure it out. Oh, see, I don't even know. Can you guys see me? I'm trying to use my phone and I just, this is really frustrating. Let me find a doodad to put my phone in and see if we can make this work or not. Here we go. All right, how ridiculously unprofessional. Yes, let me tell you. Okay, so we have Christy on. I'm gonna go ahead and I don't even know what to do with that computer. I don't even know what's working right now and what's not. Let's see if we can get Laura on here. Hope y'all have some wine because it's been that kind of day. Apparently nothing's gonna go right today. So we're gonna try this. Look how dark it is. What am I, why is it so dark? You guys, this is just terrible. Can I do lighting? Huh. I don't even know. No, I don't know what that is. Okay. Well, let's see if we can get Laura on here. I apologize, you guys. This is really very frustrating. Facebook changed something and I can't figure it out. All right. Let's see here. Who's on here? Let's get rid of that. Sherry's here and Justina's here. Oh good, Patty says we can see you, thank goodness. Oh, and you're giving me a heart just for showing up. What am I gonna do about this lighting? I'm gonna have to move. Where am I gonna sit? We're gonna, we're gonna leave the beautiful bookshelf and find somewhere that has light. Maybe I need to go outside. What is with the lighting? Oh, there, that's a little better. <laughs> Let's see if we can get Laura on here. <laughs> Learn with less. Hey, 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 what are you doing? Awesome. Okay, normally we're more organized than this. I promise you, you guys, this is just really frustrating for me. Let me see if we can get Laura on here. So what we're going to do tonight, oh, you guys, this lighting, I don't even know. Okay. Oh, look at me. I should have drank more wine, clearly. Okay. Oh, good. Laura's here and commented. So, Laura, how do you join? I don't even know what to do because I'm on my phone because nothing else will work. <laughs> ah! What a terrible night. Okay. You guys are going to make it all better, though, right? How do I get Laura? It should give you an option to invite me. Okay. So, how would I invite Laura? Does anyone know? Um, <laughs> it's just a phone. I don't know. I don't see any way to invite, oh, add, live video options. I could put a mask on, but I don't really think I need to do that. Um, hmm, hmm, hmm. Oh, there's a person. Oh, look, I can, okay, here we go. Let's see, oh, look at all these wonderful people on here. You guys are so patient and so wonderful. Okay, Laura, I'm looking for your name. I don't see your name on my list of viewers. So maybe somebody else can be our guest host. Let's see. Um, am I cracking you up for it? Well, I'm glad because I'm about ready to have a little coronary. There is, you are not on here, Laura. You are not in my viewers list. <laughs> oh, what am I going to do, Laura? I don't even know. You guys. Okay. Um, um, oh, Laura's here again. Oh, was she gone for a while? Okay. Let's see. There's Laura Rice. Maybe I could get Laura Rice on here. Um, Laura, Laura, allow your viewers to request to join. Oh, there we go. Okay, now you have to request. Did you request, Laura? I allowed you to request, so now you can request. Oh my gosh, I hope you all have something very tasty to drink. Look at all these amazing people. here. They're all gonna start leaving soon, Laura, if we don't start having something important to say. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Okay, Laura, is there a way for you to request to join? Because your name is not on my list. <laughs> bum, bum. Okay, um, Laura, what are we doing? I don't know what to do anymore. Hello, Jody. Welcome. Oh, it says have her tap the green person at the bottom. Who should tap the green person? Laura or me? I don't know who should tap. Hello from New York. Irene, I'm so glad you're here, but we're having a terrible night so far. 
And I can't, Whitney says, have her tap the green button. Laura, tap the green button. Can you do that? Do you know what the green button is? She can. Christy has faith in you, Laura, that you can, you can click the green button. Does everybody else have a green button too? Is that just how this works? Hello from Alabama. Oh, Sharon is with us. You know, this is like we have a ton of people and nothing to say because I can't figure anything out. Okay, I need light, you guys. Okay, where's Laura? Laura, Laura, Laura. Oh, look, somebody's requesting. <gasps> Laura Smith, approve. Okay, is this gonna work? Is it gonna work? Is it gonna work? Is it gonna work? Okay. I need, what do I need? I need to figure out how to get light. Is Laura here? Because my lighting in my office is about the worst thing you've ever seen. Oh, there we go. Oh, I look really green. It's kind of scary. Do I look green to you guys? Oh, look, there's my messy desk. Okay, well, we're just going to call this good. Is Laura here? Laura, honey, good thing I brought the whole bottle of wine. Okay, Laura, Kelly doesn't, Callie doesn't see you. Person, not button. Laura, person, not button. I don't know. Approve Laura Smith. Can't bring Laura Smith on camera because she's already in this broadcast. <laughs> Well, there you go, Laura. You're already in the broadcast. <laughs> okay, so how do we hang up and start over? Is that like a possibility? Um, no answer from the live video guest. Oh, see, Laura, it says you are a live video guest. I'm approving you over and over. Hmm. Yep. You are 100 and very faithful people. I oh my gosh. We did it. And look, I'm green. I don't understand the lighting. I look so green. Okay. Laura. Am I on? You're on. Can everybody see Laura? Can you give me a thumbs up? Give me a heart? Give me something? Okay. Let me turn up my volume. I mean, uh, yes, yes. Oh, I see some thumbs up. I'm on my phone. So can, is everybody, can you hear me? Like, I just never have done this on my phone. I have this weird echo though. Mm. Can you guys hear a weird echo? Like you're going twice. Let me close out some of my apps here. Can I rotate? Oh, you can't turn your phone while recording. Okay, I tried, but it wouldn't let me because all I can see is like my nose. I don't know. Okay, this is I'm the worst my thing ever. Too. You guys, so can I tell you, did Laura already tell you what we tried to do? So I set this up as an event so you guys would like get reminders when we go live. And Facebook made all these changes. I don't know, but nothing looks familiar. And when I went to go to the event, there's no way to go live. I don't know. I just, I don't know what to say, but Holly, you're watching, you're joining in and we're trying to figure this out still. Sounds good to you. Laura, if you speak, can you say something? I want to hear if they, can you hear me, Laura? I can hear you, but it's on this crazy delay. Like there's another conversation going on. Oh. So I'm going to come out and go back in. Okay. okay. Just hang out a second. Okay. Do I have to invite okay. you again? Yeah, uh, I'll have to join again, and then you'll have to add me. Okay, bye. Okay. So, guys, a half hour in, and we're still not talking about apraxia. I promise we're going to get there. I hope you guys are settled in for the evening. Um, if not, I don't know. This ridiculous thing will be, I don't know if it's going to record from my phone or not. When we do it on the computer, it records, but oh, golly, 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 golly. Okay, let's try this one more time, guys. And again, I apologize. I know your time is very precious. Okay. Oh, well, aren't you sweet, Renee? You, she said you both sound and look great. Well, I showered just for you guys. So I really appreciate that. Um, okay. Um, uh, maybe we should just cancel and do it next week. Golly jeepers, this is really frustrating. Okay, we're gonna put that there. I hate that you have to look at that light in my ceiling. Hello, Lynn. Oh, it's Michael McLeod. Yes, it is deja vu. See, it's me, Michael. It is me. I should not be allowed to be anywhere near Facebook because we had this huge issue when Michael and I, um, if you don't follow, follow Grow Now Therapy, you should because it is amazing. Okay, there's Laura. Michael, yeah, I may need you to walk me through this because nothing's working tonight. Okay, so it said Laura Smith is watching, and there's Laura Smith. Okay, it sounds good to me. I, Yay, don't, no, hear, I don't hear a double. All right, so I don't know what you guys can see. Since I'm on my phone, 
we're stacked on top of each other. I don't know. I can't even hardly see us. But anyways, um, we're going to do this. Laura, we're not even going to like have fun. We're just going to talk shop now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, now that we're all flustered. Oh, and I am. Poor Laura. She kept saying to me it, through texting, just take a breath, Carrie, calm down. It's going to be okay. I'm a really... Um, a uh, highly emotional person. And so I get stressed very easily. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate it very much. So I have my wine and I picked the glass that says classy, sassy, and badassy. And I started it sassy. I'm already down to classy. So I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to be filling it up to badassy here pretty soon, I do believe. So Laura, do you have anything to drink tonight? I did. And I bought it just for tonight. Um, this is the only one I could find online that was cute enough for today. But it was said, I'm not drinking alone. I'm social distancing. <laughs> okay. I'm in love with that. That's perfect. that's how I feel because that's why we started doing these. You know, it normally is. we would do these in person and uh, we can't. So this nope. is the next best thing. So this is it. <laughs> this is the world we live in, right? And Laura, you look so healthy and pink and I look green and gray <laughs> and like I'm on my deathbed. So you know I what I look know. pink is because I get flustered too, but I get <laughs> easily embarrassed and I turn red when I'm embarrassed. I turn red when I drink. And so some of this is just because I- You okay. look great, honestly, you look great. And okay. I wanna know if you guys could just leave an emoji in the comments, please let us know you're drinking with us and oh, uh, yes. you're ready to settle in. And yes. let us We're know if you've got wine or if you have you know, a beer, I'd like a champagne. What Even if you have got? orange juice, and orange juice is fine. Yeah, absolutely, you could have and a nice iced milk. Tea is fine. <laughs> we do not encourage um, excessive <laughs> alcohol drinking on a Thursday, but you know. Okay, so Laura, before we do jump in, I just want to let our, our um, friends know that um, I did two more because <laughs> I'm crazy. We're still talking about our um, infographic from last week on therapy strategies, but I made two more and um, th these are free on my website. This one is just a simple explanation. What is apraxia? It was my I post love today. that. It's my post today. So if you guys don't follow me, surely you follow me or you wouldn't know about this, but you can <laughs> download this. So it's a very simple explanation for parents, for caregivers about what apraxia is. And one of my amazing viewers, and I've been so flustered that I didn't even get a chance to go see who it was, but I'm going to find her. She asked me if I would do the same thing, but make it for the coach of a, of a ball team. So I just did this right before we started. You so did get it done. I That's did. awesome. So it's dear coach. And it just says, I am so excited to be on your team, but there is something I want to tell you. I have apraxia and here's what that means. And so it kind of goes through then. And um, it's from the child's perspective. It says things like, I can understand what you say as well as the other kids on my team, and I know what I want to say, but apraxia makes it hard for me to plan the mouth movements that are necessary for me to talk. So anyways, it goes through and just kind of explains it from the child's perspective. So if your child is playing on a team sport, if your child has a coach, and if that's helpful, then by all means, it's free. I just threw it up there on the website under free download. So that is Anyways. so helpful. I mean, yeah, we have some comments coming in that said that's genius. Someone said he handed it out to five families today. Oh, I um, love it. I yeah. Love it. And yeah, then we have a lot me... of comments. We got people drinking wine and champagne. We got coffee, green tea. Um, we have chocolate, of course. So I love thanks, it. guys, for joining us. I love it. <laughs> and, and Laura, you know what's interesting is somebody just commented that a lot of kids with apraxia play sports. And what that makes me think of is how, you know, one of these times we are going to talk about um, like comorbidities and, you know, coexisting yes. conditions. And that developmental coordination disorder, you know, is something that goes along with apraxia a lot of times. And I think about how important and how beneficial playing sports, you know, would be for a child who really struggles uh, planning those gross motor movements. So um, I think that, um, you know, this is this is hopefully going to be helpful for you guys if you have kiddos um, on, on, on team sports. So it totally will. That's awesome, Carrie. Okay. Last week, we talked started talking <laughs> about uh, how the SLP, speech language pathologist, prepares for apraxia therapy. And on the infographic, two, four, six, eight, ten, we had 11 different, uh, you know, strategies, I guess, that SLPs use. Uh, and we got through maybe four or five of them. Do you have yours in front of you, Laura, your infographic? I do. Okay. Do you remember where we kind of left off? Or does anybody, wait, oh, do you want to tell them about the surprise? Yes. Oh, how, oh my gosh. See, we're all flustered. We're all off our game here. Um, so we have a special um, surprise for you guys. 
uh, if you hopefully watched um, last week's uh, Uncorked, we are going to be doing a giveaway. We were going to do it now. <laughs> um, we we're going to do it 30 minutes in, but since we're a little late, it's going to come a little later in the broadcast. And um, we're going to do like a kind of like a pop quiz and see if you remember something that we talked about last week. And the first person that we see comment with the correct answer will win a free copy of my book, Overcoming Apraxia. Um, my computer is actually sitting on the books, so I can't drag one out. But Carrie you. is going curious. over to her bookshelf and we'll have it. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so you will get a free copy of that. And um, yeah, so it'll be a little fun, but you got to stick around um, to participate. So I'm glad you brought that up. Thanks, Carrie. You can't see me? How do I raise it up? My husband said, you can't see me. Can you guys not see my head? I don't know how to raise it up. Oh my gosh. How would I raise, oh, what, what? Well, well, Carrie's husband it helps her with me. that. I do actually remember where we were at. Um, we were talking about just choosing a smaller number of speech targets and focus on about like five words. Um, and I think we were pretty much around um, either elicit a large number of speech trials to build the new motor plans, <laughs> fewer targets, more trials. Um, into the focus on the movement patterns, not the individual speech sounds. And so I really love this, you know, therapy for apraxia is not articulation. We're not focused on articulation. We're focused on co-articulation and co-articulation really refers to combining the movement of sounds together, regardless of how long it is. So co-articulation can be with a consonant and a vowel, you know, uh, me, it, or it can be, you know, on is put it on so that would be considered co-articulation too so we're always really focused on that movement absolutely yeah it's kind of like co-articulation or those interweaving movements between sounds and syllables so the way i like to talk about co-articulation is if you think about when you write let's say a short phrase or a sentence if you were to write the sentence i space am space three right? I am three. So if you were to write that, there is a distinct space between the words, right? But when, when we talk, we do not talk like we write. We do not put a space in between our words because of co-articulatory transitions. So we don't say, I am three. And in speech <laughs> therapy, if we practice that segmented speech, because the opposite of co-articulation is segmentation. So if we practice that segmented speech, then we end up creating children who sound like robots. Would you agree, Laura? It's very robotic and choppy, right? So instead of I am three, we want to focus on I am three. And what you'll hear is when you say I am three, can't see me at all. Move back. Move back. Is that better? <laughs> oh, okay. So, well, I can't see myself at all. So we'll just sit back here. My husband says that's better. Okay. Um, so what am I saying? So I am three, you hear there's actually a yuh sound in there. I am, because you don't say I am, right? Because then you sound extremely, oh, I'm cutting in and out majorly. Oh, because I have to be closer to my phone, I think. Oh, this is a nightmare, Laura. <laughs> Carrie, I can actually see you just fine. I understand your husband's point. It would be better if we didn't have you from like the neck up, but I can still hear you and um, okay. see you just fine this way. So, okay, well, exit and rejoin and it will work. But since I'm the host, if I exit, I don't know. Yeah, Maybe. I have no idea if you can make me the host or not. I don't know how to do anything. I feel like we should just, what? Huh? <laughs> I don't know what he's saying. I don't know. Okay. Um, so anyways, co-articulation guys, we focus on, it's fine when I back up. Okay. Um, we, I don't know what we're talking about. We focus on movement, right? Because what does praxis mean? The root word of apraxia movement, right? So we, this is a movement disorder. So we practice movement sequences, movement patterns. So co-articulation, anybody have questions about co-articulation that all, I'm just uh, reading the comments. Everyone says you sound better. It's better. You're fine. Oh, it said I'm glitching too. We should just, I don't know. Well, you guys, I don't even know. This is, I apologize, but let's just do what we can. And you guys at least have the, uh, 
infographic thing. Okay, so where are we at, Laura? I'm gonna let you do the next one because I'm just very discombobulated right now. Well, actually, I kind of wanted to talk about core articulation and just how I learned it the hard way. Um, so I had a girl, one of my first girls with apraxia and um, she only had apraxia, which was helpful <laughs> because there wasn't any other comorbidities, but she had had a dad who traveled and they had come back to Colorado and they found me and she was doing great. And we were at the end stage of therapy, basically. And I remember very succinctly her saying, put it on. And I was like, yeah, let, let's speed it up a little bit. You know, instead of put it on, it's kind of like put it on. And she did speed it up, but it sounded like this, put it on, put it on. And I was like, oh, no, <laughs> no, this isn't good. And that was like my really good first lesson in co-articulation because it wasn't a matter of speeding it up. That wasn't the problem. And with phono kids or language right. kids, you know, you probably could just give them that cue and they'll figure it out. When mm -hmm. you teach a motor plan, you taught a motor plan. And the motor plan can't be That's set right. up or changed. So, I mean, that was probably my first big lesson, I would say, in co-articulation. And now yeah. I just, it's in everything. When I hear parents say potty, it's not potty, oh. it's potty. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's one of the things that I love to give examples. So in English, at least in American English, not in the United States, not in the UK. So Mikey, if you're watching, this is probably different. But here in the United States, a medial T is flapped to a D. Yes. So yes. we don't say water. Mother, I would like a drink of water, please. <laughs> we don't say it like that. And my mother-in-law's name is not Patty. It's <laughs> Patty, right? You don't say yes. Patty and water. So what was interesting is I used to see a little girl um, with suspected apraxia. She was two and a half. And her dad had a hearing loss and he wore hearing aids. And so I was, he was, he would really over exaggerate and over articulate words and he was saying water to her and i was explaining to him that you know try not to make it sound so unnatural we say water it's like a d sound and he was blown away by that because of his hearing loss he oh, did not know that we flapped it to a d instead of pronouncing a hard t so he was like he was just mesmerized by all the words he had been saying incorrectly his whole life that nobody had pointed out to him because he was really over exaggerating uh, those movements. So um, I know people are saying it's it's not good. So I don't know, guys, we're doing the best we can tonight. We're just going to call this um, a, a, a waste of time. I don't know, but we're going to we're going to get back. Um, if you guys want to exit and come back, I hear people saying that that's helping because I don't know. I'm telling you, I think Facebook did something because when I get they on Facebook, did. my screen looks completely different. I could not find anything. So I think that there is something beyond our control tonight. So um, anything else you want to talk about with co-articulation, Laura? Um, yeah, I think that's, that's good. Very good. So what do we have next on the list here? Okay, I love this. You know, a common question I get asked on my Instagram, I'm almost asked daily, is if I had to choose a training, what training would I choose to tell people to do? And honestly, if I had to pick one, well, it would be the Apraxia Kids training that I went to, but it's just so hard to get into and it only happens every two years. Then it was pushed out because of COVID. That's not practical and it's not helping people immediately like they need now. And I think what helps people immediately would really be the DTTC training. It's so appropriate, especially in early intervention. And the next strategy we have on the list is simultaneous production, which yeah. is part of the DTC framework. So Carrie, tell us about simultaneous production. So one of the uh, components of dynamic temporal and tactile cueing. So we had talked about I don't know if it was the second or third, or maybe we haven't gotten there yet. Now I don't even know. Did we talk about sitting face to face? Maybe we, maybe that's not even on here. I don't know. Oh, it's the next one. It's down lower. So I, I kind of didn't put these in a very good order, but we want to sit face to face with the child. And then what we want to do is really capitalize on kind of those mirror neurons. And we really want to be able to have the child visualize movement in as it's happening in context so if the child's target word is mama let's say we're working with a toddler and the child's word is mama and we're doing a puzzle that has mama and baby pieces so i hold the the mama a, you know puzzle piece of this mama dog or whatever it is next to my mouth and um maybe i try to model the word mama and the child doesn't do anything and i might say let's try it together and then what we're going to do is have the child and the adult actually say 
the target word in unison simultaneously. Um, and then what you can do is you can practice it that way for a few times. And then what you want to do is fade yourself out so that the child can start producing it uh, spontaneously. Yeah, there's a whole framework to DTTC. Um, really what this is alluding to is like Carrie said, it's that first one of simultaneous production. And then, um, you know, when you get to me, I see kids after three. And so when we're fading that simultaneous production out, the next steps to the DTTC framework are direct imitation. Um, so that's where I'm not doing it with them, but now I'm just, I'm expecting a response directly after me. And then after direct imitation is delayed feedback. I have not mastered delayed feedback, you guys. I have actually been taught by the experts who do delayed feedback, and they've given lots of suggestions on it. Um, the best way I've done delayed feedback is to do, if you're an SLP, similar to how we test kids when we don't want them to have the model right away. We just add a lot of words after it and then expect them to say something else. So if you're trying to elicit a giraffe and the child can't come up with giraffe, you say, yeah, this is a giraffe. It has a long neck and lives in the zoo. What is this? <laughs> And so that still is delayed imitation because there was all this time before you said the word giraffe. So honestly, that's my best strategy for that. But, um, you know, we're just talking some basic early strategies right now to help. Um, and so, yeah, love, love simultaneous production. Yeah, and so that's why um, even, you know, parents at home, um, if you, you know, there's a target word, getting down to your child's eye level, you know, and uh, saying it together. Let's try it together. And so yeah. it's just amazing how um, when you do those motor movements in unison, how it can really support uh, the motor planning from for the child. It's so it is really so true and having them, and you know what, you know, Carrie talks a lot about coaching and I didn't do as much coaching <laughs> um, because I was an early intervention per se, but I have people in my office, like anyone at any time for any reason, when I was doing in-person therapy, it was always welcome into my office. And um, I'm kind of getting a tiny bit off track because I know a lot of SLPs say, well, the child doesn't attend good enough, you know, or they attend better without the therapist, or I'm sorry, without the mom there. And that might be true, but the bang you get for the buck of having the parent there and watching what simultaneous production looks like and watching what my cues are, that parent is with the child 99% longer than the child is with me. So, you know, I really, I feel like parents can really use this strategy. I just had a dad today, he picked it up literally in five minutes. It was incredible. He was using, look at my face. It was great connection, eye to eye connection, simultaneous production with cues and feedback. I was like, my job is done. You got this dad. No, I'm just kidding. I mean, I have to I run the treatment it. plan, but I was like, yes, like this is what I'm talking about. That is so exciting. And, and that's why um, parent coaching or coaching teachers and paraprofessionals on strategies, giving grandparents. We're not talking like, you know, really stressful things that are going to make communicating with the child harder. We're just talking little strategies that you can embed into your everyday uh, interactions with your child, and they can make a world of difference. I can't remember. It seems like we talked about this, but then again, I do so many posts. Maybe I did a post on it. I don't know. But did we talk more in one of our episodes about the difference between, I think we did, because Jordan commented on it, the difference between motor performance and motor learning. Yes. Didn't we talk about that? Like yes. one of our, I think we one did. of the first episodes. And so parents get very concerned that, oh, I need him to focus on you in this therapy session. I need you to work on his speech. And that's great, but that's just motor performance. What I want to make sure is that these skills are practiced outside the four walls of this therapy session because that's how when the motor learning is going to happen. When you change things up, when you change the context um, in which the, the, the targets are practiced, that really is going to facilitate motor learning. And in the grand scheme of things, that's what we're concerned most about is getting that generalization and um, getting um, practice more than just once or twice a week in speech therapy. Yeah. And in fact, principles of motor learning, right? You have like one column on the left, I like to think of as acquisition, motor performance. So acquisition here, we have mass practice, drill, 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 drill. Got it, got it, got it. They can say it but that's not going to generalize yet. So then we have this like other column, this right column that I like to think of as 
the motor learning column. And the motor learning column is what's called, it, it is in contrast to mass practice and it's called distributed practice. And in distributed practice, parents are the best facilitators because distributed, they can distribute it across environments, across communication partners. And that distributed practice is what is going to get the motor learning. That's how we know true motor learning has occurred and the target has actually been learned and kind of, you know, enveloped in the motor plan. So. Right. I, I love, I yeah, lots just, of sorry. I think we just figured out what our next infographic should be. I think <laughs> we need to design that left, right. Do you know what I mean? Because I think that yeah, would be let's do it. extremely helpful for therapists because I know I actually refer to my notes um, uh, on motor learning principles. I, I like kind of created a cheat sheet because sometimes there's so many components, you know, of principles yeah. of motor learning. I think that would be extremely helpful. So what do you think if we uh, do that? And, and um, if you guys something. like that idea, give us a like or a love or something. Yeah, give us we'll something. If you, if that, I mean, we have, we have so many ideas. Honestly, you guys, this is endless. So it always is hard to narrow it down. Um, right. I do want to just touch on some comments here that I was looking at. Um, Someone said, I feel like when I try to ask little two-year-olds I see to say something with me, well, we're getting lots of likes, by the way, they just stare at me. <laughs> it can be a hard concept for the little ones. Carrie, what's your magic here? Because, you know, you're really with the two-year-olds more. I am. So this is why, and Laura alluded to this last week, that since I work in early intervention, I'm working with minimally verbal toddlers. I'm working with the most stubborn human beings on the planet to begin <laughs> with. And then you add yeah. motor planning difficulties on top of it. So my whole approach um, when working with minimally verbal toddlers is while I 100% believe in DTTC, I mean, it's evidence-based, I believe in it. Most of the kids I work with do not have the, the prerequisites to work on um, motor learning. So Laura, last, actually it's the number one, isn't it? The very first thing we yep. talked about last week was that imitation, attention, and motivation are critical prerequisites for motor learning. So what I focus on is establishing um, uh, imitation skills, starting with nonverbal imitation, right? We talked about that a little, little bit last week, and then gradually moving into more fine motor imitation, and then more um, just trying to even get imitation of, um, you know, uh, movements, uh, oral facial movements, and then finally getting to sound effects, and then eventually getting to words. So I, um, the other thing I really focus on, and I have a whole, um, I think it's a 90 minute um, self study course on creating communication risk takers in children with suspected CAS, because I'm going to tell you right now, these very young toddlers, they already anticipate failure. They already know they can't do it. They've tried to talk. Nothing so comes true. out when they open their they mouth know. to try to turn their motor on. They already know they're going to fail. Yeah. And so the more you try to tell them to say words, come on, buddy, say ball, ball, ball. Come on, put your lips together. <laughs> say ball, bounce your lips. Ball, 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 ball. You can do that till you're blue in the face. And I'm just going to tell you right now, all you're doing is putting up a wall between you yeah. and the child, okay? So yeah. it doesn't, when you're working with very young, um, minimally verbal kiddos, uh, you're going to really have to understand that we have to tweak things. And I feel like um, most speech therapy um, strategies become really effective after about age three because there's something maturity-wise that happens. I know, it's so true. You have to be to a yeah. preschooler, right? And yeah. something there really happens. is. Yeah, and that's why people, like, like a lot of people, like I know Amy Graham, she's amazing. But she's like, yeah, I don't take kids under three. You know, um, <laughs> Nancy Kaufman is like, yeah, I really don't want them until they're three. I mean, most- That's um, how I am know, too. Yeah, most SLPs are like, when they can sit and we can do our drill work and they can understand first then, and you know, we're gonna do these things, um, then they can do speech therapy. So my superpower is getting um, uh, minimally verbal toddlers to find their voice. And I do it in um, playful ways. I uh, create um, opportunities for multiple repetitions where I just become the child's voice. The way I like to explain <laughs> it to parents is your child is still in the input phase not in the output phase yet, can't motor plan from here to here. So I'm gonna become his voice, but I'm not gonna tell him to say words. So instead of saying, say ball, come on, buddy, you can do it. Say ball, 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 ball. <laughs> I'm just gonna say the word that I wish he would say, ball. Yeah. And then do it three times. Yeah. Ball, and I'm gonna pause, ball. Okay, and I'm yeah. just gonna become his voice. So yes, I have, um, 
strategy after strategy for supporting those minimally verbal kiddos. So whoever said you that, really what do. you do with toddlers? You're right. I mean, it is a whole different ballgame. So people, I have quite a few comments here asking us where these handouts are. You guys, they're on carrieebertseminars.com. Just go to the tab that says downloads. Um, free you might downloads. Have to scroll. Go to the one that says free downloads. Oh, free downloads. Okay. Uh -huh. and you might have to scroll a little bit because Carrie is pumping these out like no one's business. So I think at the top right now is the coach one. Right. Um, so if you just scroll down a little bit, you're going to see this handout. Yeah, there's the coach one. You're going to see yes. the handout that we're talking about tonight. Um, honestly, I've been keeping a binder of all of them. <laughs> uh yep. and there's mine just, yeah 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 they're all just it's nice to have an easy handout not only for yourself as a speech person but just to give to families or um yeah like that coach one it's just nice to have resources and easy resources for families so um yep. yeah that's where you can find those and then hold on let me just uh let me just catch up on the comments real quick Good. People, well, i don't see very many of the comments on my phone it it just keeps saying, yeah, I'm on my Smith computer, so I have my phone on my computer and I can scroll. So that's what I'm doing I when you're talking is I'm answering Yeah, no, that's people. good because I'm worthless tonight. <laughs> no, you're good. Um, oh, yeah. So and then just people either reiterating that they love the under threes or the under threes are hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So you said, Justina wants to know, you said imitation, motivation, and what was the third one? I think attention. attention. Listen to attention. attention. Yeah. Yep. Attention. Yep. And that again, that is on that handout. So honest to God, right. like get it's this the very first handout. thing. That yes. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Um okay. So yeah, I think we're caught up here. Um let's go ahead nice. and move on to the next one. Hey, should we real quick, should we do the question for the handout? Oh the yes. You do the question. Let's do it. Okay, you ask it because it was what you said. So you pose. So you guys, if you you had to have been watching last week's episode or have watched a rerun of it or whatever, um, Laura was talking about a client that she saw. I think he was five or six. Is that right? He was a kindergarten student that I got in okay. school. And you're going to tell us um, or you're going to ask the question um, about the story you told last week. So you go ahead. Yeah, so first of all, you guys, if you had joined us last night, I'd love to know. Sorry we're, like, making you give likes and loves, but we did, <laughs> I, I just love it for some reason, knowing, like, I'm like, it's so weird. Carrie and I are used to talking to groups, so the only way I feel like I can read your facial expressions is if you <laughs> give a like or a, a love or something. So <laughs> if you could just let us know if you watched the episode last week, give me a like or a love. Let's just see how many of you were here last week. Um, Two, because it kind of three. <laughs> I know, and I don't see any. Nothing's coming in on my phone. I see five. There oh, here five we go. So okay. Oh, no, we got an angry face. <laughs> Hopefully that was an accident. Oh, no. Uh, I'd be angry tonight, too. Wasting all this time. I know. Time. I'm sorry, you guys. <laughs> we'll call it a frustrated face, and we're right yes. there with you. <laughs> there we go. There we go. All right, so last week, here is your question tonight. And this is for um, a free copy of Overcoming Apraxia. It's my book that is a memoir of Ashlyn, my daughter, overcoming apraxia, but it's also full of resources, definitions, comorbidities, and I'm really proud of it, you guys. And I'm just so thankful and grateful because, um, you know, uh, Dr. Eusini Siegel, who is in, if you, if you know her, she is a really esteemed researcher right now, and she works at Marquette University, and she has it as required reading for her students. And I mean, that is just honestly a dream come true. Like, I wish I had known about apraxia as a grad student. So to know that it's like my book is assigned reading, like I'm just hoping we can get to these SLPs early, you know? And anyway, that aside, you get a free copy of this book. If you can remember what I talked about last week when Carrie and I were talking about how to elicit speech or imitation out of a not communication risk taker, someone who had decided that they are not going to speak. Um, what did I use with my five-year-old kindergarten student to get him to just imitate and say, ah? And so the first person who comments that Carrie and I see, and I'm looking, I'm on my computer. I know Carrie is having a hard time because on the phone you can't see as well, but I'm on my computer, so I'm looking. So if anyone can remember what I said I used, and I worked in the schools at this time, um, to elicit, oh, I almost gave an action that would give it away. Um, oh. To elicit. oh, there it is. Oh, there someone is. said it. Who's the first one I see? 
You might be it looks like it was Trish Martin May Myro yep. played ball yep. with him. Yep. Oh, Pavitra, you were so close. Pavitra follows me on my page. That was so close. I think you're a close <laughs> second, but Trish, yay! So please DM me and I'll get your address and I'll ship that out to you. Yay! Wow, I'm impressed. <laughs> Good job, you guys. Lots of the beach. Yeah, it was the ball. It was the beach ball. Very cool. That was such uh -huh. a great story. Um, someone said, Ellie Rose says, I'm a PT and I'm, I'm obsessed with all of your information. I love my PTs. Movement yeah. is such a good way to get speech. Um, yeah. Yay. Okay, Trish, cool. We'll be in touch. That's awesome. All right. Don't Carrie, forget, so. The PT on there, I have to whip out my favorite book. Uh-oh. Is a learning child. Is a learning child. It's one of my yes, favorites. Yes, I times. love that. Yes, 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 yes. I don't know. Again, I say I feel like a broken record because I do so many podcasts and so many posts and stuff. But I always say what I wish as an SLP is that we could treat every child with a PT attached to this hip and an OT attached to this hip. And if the three <laughs> of us could just go everywhere together, like I feel like we would better be able to treat the whole child. So I love that we actually have a physical therapist on here. That is the bomb. And I'm so excited about that. Me too. I love, I, and I really love co-treating in my dream of dreams. When I get back in an office, which I don't have right now, I want like the OT room. There's a reason why speech therapy clinics have OT rooms and have an OT on staff. And, um, yeah, that's a whole nother subject. We just, I could oh, go on. And we could so talk about sensory sometime. I mean, mm -hmm. that was one of the favorite talks at the conference one year was when an OT and a speech talked about sensory and apraxia yep. combined because you yep. guys the first time i met carrie i'm gonna call her out for a second um the first time i met carrie she was so passionate of course she's her and she was she, i just remember you telling me carrie like i don't think you can separate it sensory motor sensory motor we need to be looking <laughs> at both of them apraxia is a sensory motor and i just remember <laughs> you just I'm like i love this girl like she is so honest <laughs> Oh, yeah. Tell me, that's I'm wrong. Me. Tell me I'm wrong. That's not something you would say. No, that is exactly what I would say. Let me tell you. <laughs> Let me tell you. And I'm probably throwing my arms in the air. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I am extremely excitable and it doesn't take much. Like for me, like everything is a big deal, like everything. And so I'm very animated, overly passionate, probably to a fault. Um, uh, thank goodness my husband is like totally chill and super calm because if I were married <laughs> to someone who was up here, we'd be like Bleh! all the time. So he grounds me, so we're good there. I just, I literally, and Laura and I, we talk about this when we're not on live, but how this is genuinely fun for us. Like, like normal people so like fun. go ride their bikes. We're or, such I don't nerds. Know, you know, watch, watch TV. And Laura and I are both like, I don't really need a TV. Like I <laughs> want to talk about like apraxia, like all the time. So we are total speech nerds, no doubt about it. And um, we're proud of it. Right, Laura? Absolutely. We're such speech nerds. We are. Oh okay, my gosh, I feel next? bad. I'm getting a lot of comments that said, no, I was before Trish. No, I was before Trish. Oh. <laughs> you, you guys are so sweet. Um, you know what? I haven't done it in a while. I actually have a ton of books that I'm sitting on because I was going to sell them at conferences and we haven't had them. But a lot of times on Friday, I've been doing giveaways on Friday. I do a Friday funny and like I post something that a kid says and have you guys guess it. <laughs> and whoever it. guesses yeah. it wins. Maybe I'll bring that back. But um yeah, I don't know. I'm sorry, you guys. Trish, this Trish was the first person that we both saw. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. But we will, maybe we'll do more of these. Maybe we'll try to find a better way to do it. I don't even know. We'll figure yeah, something Carrie out. Yeah, Carrie did tell me she, in all honesty, Carrie did today be like, well, I think we should take all the, you know, people, put them in a pot and then draw it. And I was like, that's too hard. We're on a live. How are we supposed to do that? So we'll yeah. try and find a fairer way next week, you guys. Yes, we'll <laughs> figure something out. We'll figure something out. But thank you. Um, okay, so let's get through these because I know people like need to go to bed. Yep. Okay. So, let's um, do. So tomorrow's a work day. So the next one says speech practice should be done face to face with the child so they can see your speech movements. We kind of already talked about that. Um, if the child wants to sit on your lap, 
um, that's fine and dandy as long as you're not trying to work on speech. So if you're working on speech, you have got to find a way to get face to face. Um, and um, you may have to be the one that moves instead of getting the child, hey, look at me, look at me, especially with very young children, you may have to get in their line of sight and just make sure you're very um, consistently holding desired items right next to your, you know, next to your face. So the child is looking at, um, so like here's, pretend this is milk, right? So the child <laughs> you brings you a sippy cup glass. and is like, the you know, milk is or looking whatever. At and so, my wine glass. Yeah, the parent fills the milk up and goes, here you go, buddy, here's your milk, milk. Well, the problem is where's the child looking? They're looking at the glass of milk. So instead it needs to be here, milk. And you wanna make it acoustically different if at all possible. You want it to sound interesting, give the child a reason to look at your face. Um, and uh, again, you're just gonna model it and pause you're not going to say, now say milk. Come on, buddy. You have to do it. Say milk. Or you, no, you can't have it. No. It's yeah, me. It's not go, good. here's your milk. And then pull it back. Say milk. That is the absolute worst thing you can ever do because it's taunting. And what it does is it teaches the child that you're not trustworthy. And I promise yeah. you right now that the child must trust that you will never withhold something from him in an effort to coerce speech. So that's one of the strategies. Well, and especially sustenance. I mean, yeah, especially yeah. like a sustenance, like a food or a drink. So, right. Yeah, definitely not. And again, I'm talking with toddlers as kids get older, if you need to put demands on them, you know, to, um, uh, you know, work on something that that is certainly, you know, a, a different situation. But when you're dealing with toddlers withholding something, like, have I told you my horror story about the bubbles? I, I can't remember if I did or not. I but know. Mom emailed me and said, I'm so concerned. I think maybe I need to switch therapists. You know, we went, I think I told this, but if so, it's okay. It's a good story. Um, I don't think I've seen it. I heard it was seen at the clinic and she walked in the room and she saw the bubbles up on the shelf. And so she started signing for bubbles and the speech therapist said, Oh yes, you want to play bubbles. Okay. You need to turn your voice on and tell me with your words bubbles. And the little girl did this again. And she said, no, not with your hands. I want you to tell me with your words bubbles or, you know, she didn't mind. She said bubbles and the little girl kept signing and she Aww. got so frustrated. And the therapist said to the mom, I'm not giving him to her until she turns her voice on. And the little girl, of course, eventually had this massive, meltdown ended up on the floor crying was hysterical the mom finally got her calmed down and then she refused to go anywhere near that therapist because now yeah. she does not trust her at all she wants nothing to do with her they tried to so they left that session and the mom emailed me the next week and she said we drove to speech therapy and my daughter started crying when i got her out of the car seat because she recognized the building oh. this is not okay this is not no okay um, I've had parents write me too and be like, is it normal for kids to cry going to speech therapy? And I'm like, no, 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 no. no. And can no. I say that a kid has never cried with me or cried? No, I can't say that. But the minute that they do, we have to revamp. I have to right. know what's going on. We have to figure out what yes. happened. What was the etiology? Like speech should never be crying. And the minute that you see crying or you see those types of you behaviors, I always tell I always tell parents, exactly, we have to back off. I know you want this so bad. And Carrie right. and I both have kids with speech, with apraxia, we both know how bad you want it. But if you sacrifice their emotional health for the sake of just, I gotta get a hundred reps, buddy, you gotta get this right. in. We have lost everything. It's all we over, it's all worthless. Yeah, the way I explain it is that in speech therapy, I mean, this could be true even for a parent. Every time you're interacting with a child, um, but specifically in speech therapy, I'm always doing one of two things. I'm either teaching a new skill or I'm repairing the relationship because yeah. what I do, and this is what skilled clinicians do is we ebb and flow. We push, push, yes. push. And then yes. because we are sensitive um, communication partners, when we sense that the child is starting to struggle, is starting to shut down, you should know what that looks like. You don't continue to push. What you do is you pull back. So ebb and flow, ebb and flow. This is what we do. And this is what highly skilled clinicians just do intuitively. And it's hard to teach like a grad student how to do that, right? It's something that just comes oh, so with knowing. Push, push, push. Oh, 
I'm getting resistance. I'm going to pull back and repair the relationship. And once the relationship is repaired, then we can start again. And I feel like that's just something that um, we have to coach parents on. You don't, like you said, Laura, parents want it so bad. They want to hear the words. They want to get the practice. I'm paying $100 an hour out of pocket for this session. I want to make sure it's worth it buddy, you need to do your work, you know? And so I've been in those sessions where parents are frustrated and um, the, the child feeds off of the adults. Yeah. Um, emotions, right. It's yeah. called co-regulation. And so if the, if the adult is stressed and is, you know, highly in, is, is really intense, uh, the child is going to reciprocate that right back to you. So it's very, very important that we ebb and flow and that we are sensitive communication partners. I love that term, co-regulation. I have yeah. not actually heard that term before. Yep, it's that a big is so one. powerful, and it is so true. Like it literally describes so many of my kids. Um, depending on the parents' reaction, yeah, that's really amazing. I love that, yeah. Carrie. And and I think something that you're really great at, Laura. I mean, I haven't seen you do a ton of therapy. You've posted. You know, sometimes I watch some of the sessions you post. You, unlike me, are very good at keeping your speech rate. At a, at a good level, you know, I'm so excitable that I can, <laughs> you know what I mean? You're very calm and collected. And I feel like you probably naturally um, entice that co-regulation. Uh, whereas for me, what I've had to learn to do over the years is to recognize, okay, Carrie, you need to match what the child, um, what their um, temperament is. Because sometimes you get yeah. those kids who are a little quieter, who are a little more reserved, who are not exactly what I would call, you know, risk takers of any kind. Yeah. And I come in and I'm like, Pick -a -boo! you know, and the kids are like, oh. <laughs> so sometimes what I have to do is I have to back off. I have to be a little less animated. I have to be a little quieter. I have to be a little bit um, less passionate in my actions and reactions because I can escalate the child. And so learning about yes. regulation has been really powerful for me. And it's really about matching the temperament of the child so that you can get the most out of that session. So I'm gonna ask you real quick, cause I can just think of a person out there who's watching you and they're like, okay, I'm with you, Carrie, I hear you. You're saying like, oop, you know, I pushed the child, I got this pushback, there's that ebb and flow. So now I'm gonna be like, ooh, I better flow back. What does flowing back look like? So that is where you um, remove all pressure to speak. For that moment, I'm going to remove all pressure to look at my face when I talk. In fact, what I'm probably going to do is stop talking so much and stop trying to elicit speech. And in that moment, what I'm going to do is follow the child's lead, see what they're interested in and play. And yeah. for that moment, maybe I'm going to become more of a good language model and just more repair the relationship in a manner that is not focused on eliciting speech. So that's what I mean by that is I pull back and repair the relationship, regain the child's trust and let them know, buddy, I hear you. I see you. I feel your emotion. And I know without you telling me you need a break, I understand that you are at, you're maxed out right now. And to me, that's um, about being sensitive. And I think that we sometimes as therapists, because we have productivity and we need to get a hundred reps and, you know, we have all this pressure on us, you know, especially for me in private practice, all of my families pay out of pocket for every service that, that, that they get. And so I get that. So that's why I make sure to explain to the families that I work with that it's not about what we get done in this session. What matters most is that you know what to focus on when you leave yeah. here, you know, because sometimes you get these young kids and they're just not, they're not feeling it today. You know what I mean? They're not interested. They didn't nap well. I don't, they haven't pooped in three days. They're constantly, I don't know. There can be a lot of reasons why kids don't feel good. They're not in the mood. Yeah. It's just talking, you know, talking is hard. And if I'm not in the mood, um, there's nothing you're going to do to make me talk. And so yep. I need to make sure I have a family coming actually from Mississippi, I think, um, to do a week of intensive with me um, sometime this summer. And I needed to let them know this is a toddler. So a lot of what we're going to be doing is parent coaching, because if they drive all the way here and think I'm going to sit there for like hour after hour and drill their child, that's not appropriate. And that's not something that I can do um, and, and ethically, you know, bill for. So it's always important to really think about not just the age of the child. Um, my son, who is autistic and also has a diagnosis of apraxia um it's more about what's developmentally appropriate so my son yep. is nowhere near where his peers are if you look at what's age appropriate so it's really about understanding
meeting where every child is at. And Laura, don't we say this all the time, meet the child where they are at. And that is going to differ from session to session just because of life, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I want to tell a story too, just in a different vein, because I'm older. So in the three and up crowd, I mean, I will have kids who are verbal enough to say, this is hard. And so I think the natural inclination for a person and uh, for a person who is a speech therapist, when someone hears this is hard, is for you to just be an encourager and say, no, you can do it. But that's not so I'll just give you, let me give you a little tidbit that happened this week. I have an amazing, I just hired an SLPA. If you don't know what that is, it's a speech language pathology assistant. She's absolutely incredible. Absolutely love her. Um, she was hired at the first interview, even though I did too. She has a brother with Down syndrome. She totally understands the family situation. Um, it's why she became, like, it's why she got her degree in speech. I mean, she gets it. Let's just say she gets it from the family role. So you know, she was coaching or she was treating one of my uh, girls yesterday and I have a relationship with the girl that was built. And so now, you know, I had my SLPA working with her and I could tell the girl was getting frustrated, but I was trying to decide before I jumped in, is it because I know this girl and I've learned or, you know, is, is my SLPA going to be able to read her cues? And so the girl did get frustrated until she finally, she's verbal enough to be like, hard hard and of course my SLPA meaning well was like you can do it you got it but she'd already tried five times and couldn't do it so if you that's essentially the child is interpreting that as you're lying to them because she can't do it she just told you it was hard and so that's when I did jump in and I turned on my camera and I was like hey and I'm like you know what this is hard this is hard and you are working so hard and I'm proud of you. And then just to acknowledge that and move on. And that was the ebb and flow. The ebb and yep. flow is not, you got it. Keep trying, keep trying, keep trying, keep trying. And even though the child is telling you it's hard, hard, the reaction then isn't keep trying. The reaction no. is like, you tried so hard, good work, move on. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think that's, I mean, that's such an important message. I mean, we could do a whole you know, uh, uh, episode kind of on just, you know, growth mindset and on helping kids. Mm -hmm. Yes. But we, when a kid says it's hard and you say, that's why we're doing it together, but you're right. It is hard. And are you ready to move on? You know, I think giving the, because it is true. We need to listen to the kids. They know, they know they can't do it. They know it's hard. You know, if depending on where you're at in that process, um, you can try giving them a different cue. You can try yeah. changing your approach, but if you, if you push too much further, you're going to lose her altogether. Right. And yeah. so you have to yeah. decide, is it worth that to get two more repetitions that probably aren't going to be anywhere close to her best, you know, attempt anyway. So, and that's where, that's where the intuition comes in. Like, you know, an SOPA is just learning. So we wouldn't expect her to know. Now, if it was me with the child and I had had that, that, that situation with her, I would actually, I just, I don't know, this is what you say, Carrie, where you can't teach it. Like, I intuitively know whether I can get her to do it or not. Yeah. Yep. And so That's if nice. I really believe at the moment, like, oh, like we are just, something's going wrong and I'm not going to be able to get it, I'll move on. There might right. be a situation, possibly, very possibly, where I was like, you're right. This is really hard. Give me one more try because I think we can do it. And uh -huh. if you say one more try, honor that one more try. I'll see this too. Right. People will send me videos and be like, what do you see, you know, in this video? And it's a therapist that's like, just give me one more try. And the kid gives them one more try and they don't do it right. So the therapist is like, just one more try. You already said one more try. And then, then you get right. a meltdown. Like, of course you got a because meltdown. let's be clear here. The child doesn't trust you because you're, yeah. your words, you don't mean what you say. Yeah. So you must. You must treat children with respect. It doesn't matter, you know, the age of the child, say what you mean and mean what you say and honor the words that you say. It's not the end of the world if you don't get five more repetitions of no. a target word, because let's be clear, this is motor performance anyways. This isn't, you know, the motor learning. So we need to make sure that we preserve the relationship. Um, that is yeah. what is so critical. And that's say, what I wrote last night or last yeah. week after our talk was I had a picture of me and a girl, but I made it like a graphic and it was trust is the foundation to yes. any relationship you have to anyone yeah. that you decide to enter into. 
even Carrie and I doing these lives, there has to be some sort of mutual trust that I trust her to do what she says she's going to do. And she trusts me to say what I'm going to do. You have to have that no matter what relationship. So unless you have, and, and the child, trust is not given. Per, it right. is always earned. earned. A child has no earned. reason just to give you their trust and be like, okay, yeah, you must be the person that's going to help me. You have to prove it. And if you don't yep. prove it, your relationship is over. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. It is. And yeah, so I think that is, it's, I, I love that you brought that up though, that when the child says this is hard, you need to acknowledge it and give them the choice maybe if for older kids, do you want to try one more or are you ready to be all done and move on? Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. I mean, give them a choice then. I mean, um, so yeah, I, I think that's, that's fabulous. I love that we went there. Okay. What do we have okay. next here, Laura? We're almost there. So, um, very, very speech practice. Yeah. Go ahead. No, you do. Yeah. This so, one. okay. So very speech practice by having the child use targets in different contexts. Um, and different, so this is again, going back to the principles of motor learning. And if we're looking at that left versus right chart, left being acquisition, right being kind of um, motor learning, the generalization of everything, varying the speech practice is gonna get you to that motor learning component. So we can practice, let's say the target word is mom, mama, we can practice it in the same prosody, in the same context, with the same toy, every every time and the child's 95 percent accurate with no cues and then they leave the office and i can guarantee they're not doing it so um varying speech practice is not only fun i find it fun but it actually is serving the purpose to get generalization so i love um you know there's like there's commercial stuff on the market now where you can vary your prosody but i mean in simple terms with my kids i love just using target words and let's say if it was mama let's say Let's say it in a mama voice, mama. Let's say it in a daddy voice, mama. Let's say it in a baby voice, mama. And just varying it like that. And by doing that, their brain is planning and programming those movements for the sounds in a variety of different super segmental patterns, which is going to promote motor learning. And so right. it's one of my and, favorite things to do. I love it. And let's say you're at, maybe the child can do, you know, more than mama. Maybe they can add another syllable or two. So maybe, hi, mama. Love yes. you, mama. Mama yes. go, mama up. Up, mama. Bye, mama. Hi, mama. Mama, no. You know, so it's just <laughs> taking that word and then varying, is it at the beginning or the end of a phrase, right? Um, do we, you know, so yeah, it's, it's so helpful. And I know you guys get tired of me showing this book. Let me see. Laura, you talk for a minute. Let me find something. The other thing we have on here is loudness. So I find that people really um, don't know that loudness can be an element of prosody. And in fact, when my daughter was little, she wasn't able to increase her volume, which was a symptom of the prosodic disturbances. That's one of the criteria for apraxia that you have to have. Um, but then ironically enough, as a lot of kids get older and they do get to start talking better, they find a difficult time modulating their voice lower. So like even my daughter now will be talking in a very, very loud volume. And we're like, Ashlyn. And she's like, what? I'm like you are so loud. And it is a difficulty varying the, the volume, which is an element of prosody. And so volume can be really fun to work on too. Absolutely. So I don't know if you guys have ever seen this book. It's called Dude. And it's the only word in the whole book. So for people <laughs> who like surf, you know, for kids who know anything about surfing. Oh, great. So now my phone's going to die. Here, let me plug this in. This is all we need. Yeah, <laughs> it's been one of those, one of those days, you know? So great. Okay. So oh hang God. on here. I am just like not even. Okay. There we go. Close that. Come on, phone. Okay. Well, now I have to hold it because now it won't go in the thing. Oh, my word. <laughs> this is oh, our my. hot mess sesh. This is our hot that mess is episode. Is everybody allowed a hot, hot mess, mess, mess episode? Okay. I don't know so what's anyways, going on. Dude, it just depends on the exclamation or, you know, on the um, how big it's written. So there's dude with an exclamation point. And there they hold the vowel. Dude. So <laughs> That's that cool. Um, and then, you know, there's one with like a, an exclamation or I mean, uh, there it is really loud. And then it's a question mark, dude, but it's I a quiet it. question mark. So anyways, that's the only, it's a whole story, but the only word in the book is dude. And last week I'm sure I shared, cause I share this all the time, but best book I love that one. Prosody is moo yeah. because again, it's only one word in the whole book, but depending on the punctuation. So any book that is going to have varying punctuation will naturally work on prosody. 
And just to mention this, Laura, because I learned this at one of our Apraxia Kids conferences, I think it was two years ago. It is the only commercial prosody program that I am aware of. It's excellent. It is called the Prosody Treatment Program by Rothstein, Joseph Rothstein. And it has a section for preschoolers and then a section for like elementary through high school. Wow. So it's excellent. I have not heard it of is. that. Oh yeah, it's phenomenal. Um, so I highly recommend it. You can see it's not huge, so it's like very manageable. Do you know what I mean? Like yes. I really love it. Highly, highly, highly recommend it. Um, and it's the only one that I'm aware of, the only formal prosody treatment program. So, and wow. just for our followers who don't know, prosody um, disturbances are actually part of the ASHA definition of what CAS is. We know that it has, you know, causes problems with, um, you know, programming the movements for speech production, but also in the prosodic elements. Um, SLPs, we talk, we call them suprasegmentals of speech. So those extra elements, it's not what you say, it's how how you say it, right? Absolutely. And that's prosody. For our parents who are watching, prosody is the melody of speech. Okay, that's kind yeah. of what we talk about. It's kind of that melody, which hopefully means when Laura and I speak, we don't put you to sleep. And do you remember <laughs> having like a professor in college who like lulled you to sleep because they talked in a monotone voice and never varied the production <laughs> of their da, da, da. So that's what we as SLPs know is prosody matters uh, a great deal. And I actually wrote a post to uh, probably two weeks ago. And I said, if you're treating apraxia and you don't have a pro if, I said, I don't know who needs to hear this, but if you're treating apraxia, prosody needs to be a goal because if the child is apraxic, there has to be prosody problems. If there's not prosody problems, right. then they probably shouldn't have a diagnosis of apraxia. So right. that is one of the main it's criteria. In the definition. So, um, it's in the right. definition. Somebody just so asked by you. definition, go ahead. Um, somebody asked, should we be treating prosody in our minimally verbal toddlers? Absolutely. I mean, that's why I do so much with sound effects because sound effects obviously are filled with you know, uh, prosodic variation. So like mm -hmm. I, um, you know, like I was playing with a fire truck with this one little girl and, um, you know, I was like, woo, 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 you know, <laughs> making that sound. And she's like, uh, uh, uh. And I'm like, wow. That, and you know what I mean? There was nothing about it that sounded anything like she wasn't in her falsetto. She wasn't, you know, able to sustain her vowels. And so she had not, nothing that sounded anything like a fire engine. So I really like to use sound effects. Um, the old classic uh, uh, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, you know, where the, like Laura <laughs> kind of uh, modeled for you, Papa Bear's voice, Mama Bear, Bear's voice, Baby Bear's voice. That's why we make different characters have different voices when Laura and I read aloud. It's very intentional. Everything that we do, a lot of times what people think when they see Laura and I interacting with a child is, oh, you're so good with kids. And, you know, Laura and I are good with kids, but that's not what makes But it has a purpose. SLPs. Everything we do is intentional. And what we as SLPs have to get better at doing is coaching parents and caregivers on specifically what it is we are doing. Because I think we assume yeah, that oh, they're going to watch so and too. they're just going to know. No, nobody no. knows because it looks like all we're doing is just playing or just reading. And Laura and I never just play or just read. Nope, it always has a purpose. Believe it or yes, not, right. you guys, there is always a yep. purpose behind it. All right, let's get through these last two, Laura. We're almost done, I... Carrie. We got this. You do the next one. All right, determine how to practice speech targets. So um, this is based on principles of motor learning. If you have black, block, blocked or masked um, practice, there's different words, right, Laura? Are those the two words that go together, blocked or masked, if you want to call them? Are they the same thing? So technically, mass practice and blocked are different, but it's oh, okay. so muddy. It, they are technically different, but I okay. mean, for our purposes tonight, because we're trying to make this as parent friendly as possible for you guys, you can just you can get into all the details and research and that's not really going to help anybody. We wanted this handout to really just be accessible to parents and speech therapists in the moment. So I think for our purposes tonight, we're just going to say block Blocks. practice, mass practice. Okay. So blocked practice, you focus on one target at a time and you're gonna try to get 100 reps or 50 reps and you're just gonna do it over and over and over and over. And blocked practice is really important for acquiring a new skill, right, Laura? Absolutely, and actually I could just say, you could have a block of three targets and still get mass practice oh. within the block. 
Gotcha. So that would be the only difference I just want to say. But essentially what we're talking about, it's all in that left column. And Carrie, you and I should do an infographic because yeah. really all you need to know is the left column of mass practice is promoting acquisition. So that's that block to that mass over and over and over and over and over again. And then when we move to um, random practice, that's where you're going to intermix your targets. So you're not. And that's where we're in the right column. If you're thinking right. about for, columns. <laughs> for motor learning. So yeah. you're not going to just say, oh, we're going to do this target word 50 times. You might take your five target words and you're going to play a game where those five target words are embedded in. So it's yes. going to be intermixed practice um, throughout uh, the activity. Yep. Sound good? Anything else you want to add? No, I think that's good. Um, and then the last thing is this, this is actually really important for principles of motor learning. And I would say, um, you know, guys pay attention because this is different than how we treat phono disorders or speech delay. This is an integral, integral difference is that we provide more frequent cueing and feedback. So language stimulation does not have this. Um, perhaps if you were taught certain phonological approaches, you maybe were taught some cueing depending on who your supervisor is, but cueing is not really a part of phonological disorder. It is so essential for apraxia with cueing. There's, Carrie has a great mind blowing post on literally cueing is so extensive. We don't even have time to talk about all of it. <laughs> but suffice it to say, you have to help the brain plan and program the movements for speech. And how we do that is you might give, you know, my basic cues, you can go read Carrie's posts for more extensive cues, but my basic cues that I use in my practice are going to be visual cues. So let's say if I want the kid to say, Papa, this is my cue for P. Other therapists like Papa, and that's their cue for P. Um, you know, if I'm going to have the child say baby, I might go baby. So we're differentiating with my finger movements every single consonant. Um, David Hammer, um, a proxy expert now retired, really loved the use of verbal cues, and I use verbal cues too. So um, Jenny Bjorum also has them with her program. Use your popcorn sound. I want to hear your popcorn sound, pop, pa. So that's a cue. And then when you go to teach them another word, you can use that cue and say, okay, I want you to start with your popcorn sound, and now let's try, you know, P or whatever. So anyways, these are so important and it is really an essential part of a therapy. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And in fact, um, when we look at uh, doing assessment, I mean, this is why the DEMS, the dynamic evaluation of motor speech skill is so important because it actually is a dynamic assessment, which has kind of a cueing hierarchy built into it. So when yeah. you are the, as the SLP, when you are trying to figure out how can I help this child be successful in motor planning those movements, you must have a ton of tools in your toolbox and those multi-sensory cues are going to be so essential um, because these kids are going to need help figuring out how to plan those movements and so for very young toddlers if any of you work in early intervention for example to get like the lip spreading for e i just love to have kids either slide down a little mini slide or have little <laughs> baby dolls or teddy bears down a slide and wee we because it kind of you know mimics the movement of e because you can hold it for a long time or bouncing a child on a ball boing boing ba 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 <laughs> yeah because then they can feel the movement of their lips bouncing when i say bounce your lips they actually feel the bouncing as i'm bouncing them on the ball so um it's a big component and um whenever you know uh slps will ask me oh i have this child and i can't get him to imitate i've tried everything and i say well what have you tried what multi-sensory cues have you tried and they often can't tell me um you know they're i'm just trying to get them to imitate well if they don't imitate then what are you doing to teach imitation because it mm -hmm. really comes down to your cues and chapter uh, is it seven no i don't even know chapter or whatever the book Dave and I wrote, we have a whole chapter on 
uh, multi-sense, yeah, it is chapter seven, multi, using multi-sensory cues in therapy. And we have a whole chapter on explaining what they are and examples of them, because you cannot do traditional articulation therapy. You cannot do language stimulation therapy. You cannot increase ambient language exposure and think that kids with a motor speech disorder are gonna learn how to talk, okay? That's where speech therapy um, uh, becomes, it's completely ineffective because you have to use a motor-based approach when the child has a motor speech disorder. And um, I posted, like I said, today I posted um, whatever, I don't know, some handout, maybe this, what is apraxia? And I actually say on there um, something about you know, children do not, uh, apraxia is not something children outgrow. Speech therapy based on the principles of motor learning is necessary for children with apraxia to make progress. And I cannot tell you how many SLPs messaged me and said, what are the principles of motor learning? Yeah. Okay. You can't do treat you apraxia know. if you don't know the principles of motor learning. And that's why ASHA actually says, who treats apraxia, who assesses, diagnoses, and treats apraxia? SLPs with specialized training in motor speech yeah. disorders. Because unfortunately, not every speech language pathologist has that training. Right, Laura? Well, and it's true because we don't get it in graduate school, you guys. Right. So I mean, it really is who, what trainings have you gone post-grad? Who were your mentors? What clinic did you work in? I'm not mm -hmm. saying that there's no SLP ever who doesn't have the training. In fact, um, you know, a colleague in my practice, Meredith, worked for Julie Huffman, Hoffman, who is a famous, you know, not a famous, but you know, a well-known practice. She's great. In She's Louis. in Missouri with me. Yeah. Yeah. St. Louis. And yes. Um, yes. I was like, Okay, you know, because when people call me and they're like, oh, I have experience with a proxy out of grad school, I'm like, mm, you probably didn't. So who is your supervisor? And once she said that, I was like, okay. you do. <laughs> we love so Julie Hoffman. Never love, love, love Julie Hoffman. Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. She's great. She is. She's amazing. She is. I love her personality. She's so much fun. Okay. <laughs> so, so yeah, yes, we made it through it all, I feel like. Yeah, the last thing I want to end on, if you're okay with this, is I just want to, because hopefully there are some quite a few SLPs on here, um, this will be over the head, I think, of parents, and I don't expect parents to differentiate this, but Laura, real quickly, let's end on the two different types of feedback. We have um, uh, um, performance, and oh, would you help me out, Laura? Um, yeah, knowledge uh, of performance and knowledge of results. KP and KR. Oh my gosh. Knowledge of performance Honestly, and knowledge of results. Honestly, on any given day, I will forget those as well. <laughs> I just, they're just such weird words to say. Do you know what they I mean? Maybe if I hadn't words. had half a glass, half a bottle of wine. I'd right? Like, like okay. we weren't all flustered from our technical Oh, problems. I'm so flustered. I'm still frustrated because this is going to be recorded and people are going to think we're idiots. But anyway, okay. So <laughs> um, there are two types of feedback based on principles of motor learning. And again, when we do this left and right column, when a child is acquiring a new skill, we use knowledge of performance feedback. And what that means is we tell the child what they did right or wrong. We're very specific. I like how you popped your lips. I didn't hear your, um, your snake sound. You know what I mean? We're telling them specifically what they did right or wrong. That's knowledge of performance feedback. And that is necessary for acquisition of a new skill. Knowledge of results feedback, you only tell the child if they were right or wrong. So this is where you say things like, good job, way to go, nailed it. And they Not both quite. have a place. Yes, not quite, try again. So knowledge of results feedback is what we use once we're into that motor learning where the child is supposed to be relying on their own feedback system. So we say, ah, was that it? And we want the child to think about how they said it. No, that wasn't it. Fix it and try it again. And yep, so, so that's it, that right level column. Right, so- And you have the like, trust of the child. Yes, the trust, absolutely. So um, the example, the analogy I like to give is if I'm gonna learn to play tennis and Laura is my tennis instructor because I've never played tennis before and Laura is teaching me how to serve. And so if I go to serve the ball and I serve it into the net, 19 times in a row it goes into the net. And the 20th time I go to serve it and it sails over the net. If my coach, if Laura says, that was a great serve, that was an ace, way to go. So she gave me knowledge of results feedback and I'm learning a new skill. The problem is I have no idea why the 20th serve went over the net and the first 19 didn't go. But if I serve the 20th one over the net and Laura says, I like how high you threw the ball that time. Okay, now I'm like, holy crap, 
that must be the answer. What I need to do from now on when I serve is throw the ball a little bit higher. That is knowledge of performance feedback. So please understand, you guys, that in the beginning stages, as the child is acquiring a new skill, you must use um, knowledge of performance feedback. But then what you're going to do, you're going to vary. When you give the feedback, you're not going to give feedback every time, right? Based on principles of motor learning, you're going to vary the uh, feedback frequency and how, you know, when you give it, how often you give it, and then you're going to start switching to knowledge of uh, results feedback. Nailed it. Not quite. Fix it and try it again. Right. So yeah. that is. And you can't really develop important. that relationship with them. I mean, if you see me with a kid, let's say, um, you know, I just have a kid who's new to my caseload, just turned three, fresh out of EI. And, you know, right now I am heavily loading him with that knowledge of performance. And sometimes knowledge of performance is me teaching him my cues. So, you know, he was trying to say the word, I, my target today was out. And he was saying ouse. And I was like, ooh. And I'm like, I heard ouse. Like, can I, I want you to like tap. I want to use a tap. Let me hear out. And then he said out. And I was like, oh, I heard you say your tapping sound. Good job. So a lot of times I can use knowledge of performance to teach my cues. And it is heavily loaded every single time this kid says something, I'm going to follow it up. Like, or if he says something right, you know, like, good job. Like I heard whatever. And I keep telling them what I heard. So the next time I go to cue them, they have that in their brain. So let's yeah. say, now let's fast forward to a kid I've had five years and we're on the end stage of therapy. It is exactly what Carrie said. I am not giving them that feedback every time. We are end game here, people. Like he should, I need him monitoring himself. I need him listening to himself. And so it does very much look like, mm. and you'll see Amy Graham do this really good on Instagram. Uh -huh. <laughs> She's like a master at her facial expressions. And the uh -huh. kid will be like, and they'll like do it over Fix and do it, it correctly. And she'll be like, yep, there we go. Yep. It is. It's all about fixing it. I mean, I like to even for older kids suggest that SLPs write a goal that the child will repair, um, you know, utterances based on knowledge of results feedback. I mean, you wow, should that's be a able good to say, one. I like that. Eh, no, not quite. Fix it. Try again. Yeah, um, I like and the that. The child should. That is principles of motor learning, and that's what makes this therapy look and sound different from articulation it therapy, is. from it's so logic different. therapy from language stimulation therapy, apraxia therapy. Laura and I should be able to look at anybody and go, oh, they suspect CAS. And how would I know? Because they're using principles of motor learning in yeah. Um, yeah. in their sessions. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, I just have to tell you, because you can't see it, but Allison Ebert just said, hi, mom. Oh, hi, daughter. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cute. Allison is going to be a teacher. I'm so proud. She is a senior in college and she starts her master's program this summer and she is going to teach early elementary. Isn't that the coolest thing ever? I'm so proud of her. So excited. That is. And then the last thing, Carrie, we would just hold up your book because someone said the last book Carrie held up says it's for SLPs. Can I learn from it even though I'm not an SLP? Yeah. I, I, okay, I read so this book. I have this book and yes, I believe you can. Yeah, Dave Hammer, um, Laura mentioned him. He retired in 2019. He's amazing. He was like my hero. And when he showed up at my conference in Pittsburgh in 2017 or whatever it was, I about fell over. I thought, why is he at my, I mean, Aww, I was, I was, cool. it was crazy. But we became fast friends. And when he asked me to write this book, I, again, was just overwhelmed. I couldn't even believe it. So um, it is called The SLP's Guide, um, but I have had, many, many, many parents purchase it. Um, it came out at the end of 2018 and or beginning of 2018, I guess. Um, and it is, yeah, I've never had a parent say I didn't get it or I didn't understand it. So um, I think it is it's very really well written. It has so many great activities. You guys, I honestly read it on the plane to an apraxia conference and on the way back. And because I knew Dave so well, I did not know you Carrie at the time, but because I uh -huh. knew Dave so well, I could pick out the parts Dave wrote. And then the other parts, I was like, hmm, I never heard this before. Carrie must have written this. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yes, it was fun. It was, and what was crazy is, you know, Dave lives in Pittsburgh. I live in Kansas City. And so we wrote it completely. I mean, no, we only got together one time. That's um, amazing. Final version. Otherwise, it was all done via email. We never, I mean, it was an insane year. We had a deadline from the publisher and, oh, it was stressful. You know, you wrote a book, Laura. You know how stressful it is. But, but um, I didn't have a deadline from a publisher. Oh, okay. That yeah, would be did. stressful. Definitely. Yeah. It was stressful. So anyways, that book <laughs> is available on my website if you are interested. Um, 
All right, Laura, it has been an extremely yeah, long Yeah, we got to go. I, Laura, like, I'm so to, yeah, apologize for the craziness. I am not going to do an event next week. We are going to try <laughs> to go back and just do it the old-fashioned way. I don't even know. I'm embarrassed that this is recorded. but And maybe it won't be because I did it on my phone. I have no idea. But anyways, you guys, thank you for your patience. There are still 93 of you on here. That's pretty amazing, I think. So anyways, <laughs> all right, guys. Us, you guys. Bye. We'll see you next week. Bye.